The question we're going to answer today, that's actually a three-part question. I got a few questions here, and I kind of want to roll them up into one. And the questions that I kind of picked out that I would like to answer, what is methadone and does it help addiction? What methadone withdrawal is like? And finally, methadone versus suboxone. Let me uh, make some distinctions here between methadone and suboxone. Uh, methadone is uh, what's called an opiate agonist, and but that is it's a synthetic opiate agonist. And what does that fancy term mean? Uh, it means this: it's completely made in a laboratory, okay, versus opium, all right, or even heroin, which is partially synthetic, okay. It's completely made in the laboratory. It is in the class of drugs that are called opiates, okay. And it's an agonist. That means it goes on to the uh, uh, respective receptor. Uh, in this case, mainly the mu receptor is the one that is of particular inter interest for euphoria. And that's in the central nervous system. There's two other types of receptors and some subtypes that are throughout your whole nervous system. It goes to the receptor and binds to the receptor. And that means it's an agonist. It turns on the receptor and has upstream effects. That's methadone. It was <clears throat> discovered or made in a laboratory first in Germany, uh, I believe in the 1930s. I believe if I re uh, recall correctly, uh, some Nazi scientists also worked on it. If you look at German history in the early 20th century and then during mid 20th century, one of the problems the German military always, always had was because of international relations, they always had a shortage of drugs and supplies. And so they're big, big, they were big proponents of amphetamine and stimulant type substances for their soldiers to that same effect that they needed medication for the soldiers. They were also short on pain medications. In addition, everyone was always trying to make a medication that was less addictive than the previous one. In this case, it was heroin. Keep in mind, as a side note and of some historical interest, is that heroin was put together in a laboratory in Germany in the late 1880s, I believe 1887, by a German group of scientists, and I don't recall the name of the main one, and believe it or not, they worked for Bayer Aspirin Company. And in that laboratory, their goal was to have a cough suppressant and a pain medicine that was much less addicting than morphine. And voila, they came up with heroin, much more addicting than morphine. And if you look at the history and how they came up with the name, they all took some heroin and they felt heroic, and hence the name heroin. And so it was sort of manufactured, marketed, and sold worldwide as a less addicting cough suppressant than morphine. And that's how heroin came about. And we know what happened after that, especially with World War I and all the guys that needed pain medication and addiction. Well, methadone kind of came about the same way. It's synthetic, purely made in a laboratory. It's in the class of drugs as opiates. And it's a full agonist, just like heroin, just like fentanyl, just like dilaudid, just like morphine, just like opium, oxycodone, the list goes on and on. So that's what methadone is. One of the values that was seen in this drug over the next 20, 30, 40 years, and at some point, some US laboratories, I believe, bought the patent, uh, is that they noticed that it's extremely long acting, 24 to 36 hours. And because you need less frequency in dosing, unlike heroin, this sort of uh, to, uh, the idea and thought came that this would be a wonderful replacement medication to manage uh, a substitute medication to manage opiate addiction because you'd have to dose less, much less frequently. It keeps the patient's cravings and withdrawals at bay. And uh, in the long run, it could do much better in that way. So this all sort of developed in the 60s. And if you kind of look back into popular culture in the 70s, you know, this was the thing. And you can even see it in some of the literature uh, that came out then. Allen Ginsberg and the Beat Generation. There's a, uh, books, movies. Uh, the book is called Junkie with uh, uh, not Allen Ginsberg, but uh, William Barrows. 
And these guys really toted and talked about the sort of the culture of uh, taking methadone and heroin. Uh, it was sort of the wonder drug uh, in the 60s, 70s, places like New York, Europe, Vienna, even the Middle East. And uh, uh, so that's that. And today we have, you know, methadone treatment centers. Uh, they have to be federally regulated and supervised. And there's very strict rules to using methadone. It comes with some consequences uh, because it is quite long acting, uh, because it has what's called fat solubility. It goes into your adipose tissue. Dosing it when you start methadone is a little bit tricky and takes a little bit of time and it takes a little bit of practice and art to start the dosing and getting it right over several days to even weeks, okay? So that's one of the things about methadone. And a lot of this has to do A, with the long acting nature and B, with the fact that it goes into the adipose or fat tissue and gets stored in there. So the other issues with methadone are the fact that you have to go in somewhere every morning to get this medication, at least in your initial start of the medication until you sort of almost build a report card where they give you some take home medication, okay? That used to be a big problem when it was every day. You have to get up at four in the morning, take a few buses, few trains, and you would see this on the East Coast just to get there at 5.30 or 6 a.m. to get your dose for the day. This is very inconvenient for someone who's trying to lead a normal life. The reason it was early in the morning is if you go into the history of this drug on the East Coast, or rather the history of the people that, that were addicted to opiates and heroin, most of them were blue collar workers where this started to get initiated. And so they had to be at work early in the morning. So the way these clinics were set up was these guys go before work, take their dose and go to work. So uh, A, uh, it's a little bit tricky and takes some time to dose you up. B, you are sort of, and this is why they call it liquid handcuffs. Within the subculture of the methadone addict uh, over the 70s, 80s, 90s, they call it my liquid handcuffs. You can't go anywhere. You can't change your schedule. You can't do anything. In addition, since it's a straight agonist, full agonist, which means it just goes on there and turns on the re necessary receptors, uh, you can overdose off this medication and there is euphoria uh, associated with it. Remember, it goes on there, turns on the receptor. What does heroin do? Goes on there, turns on the receptor. What does, meth uh, what does the dilated fentanyl oxycontin do? It goes on there, turns on the receptor. So there is uh, this issue as well. It can give you a euphoria at a high enough dose and also you can potentially overdose on it. It also comes at certain doses with cardiac disturbances. It's called, uh, kind of doesn't matter, but for those of you that want to be nerdy about it, it's called torsade de puentes. It's a French term. And it's an arrhythmia that can cause a heart attack, right? So at certain doses, you have to watch for that change in what's called the EKG electrocardiogram pattern to see if they're achieving certain dangerous level of this medication in their body. It gets dosed up over a certain period of time. And then eventually, which we don't have any validated data of when to come off of it, they can start to slowly dose you down and get you off of this medication. And this takes quite a long time, right? If someone's using heroin, I have a good sense of what's in their body, both clinically and physiologically or, or uh, um, uh, pharmacologically, in three to five days, I really know where you're at. Where this medication, depending on your fat solubility and how long you've been taking it, this stuff gets stored in your fat tissues. So getting you off this medication can also be a little bit tricky. Nevertheless, the data is clear on methadone at an international level, if given right, that this stuff reduces relapse, increases scores, for activities of life, maintaining a job, not going to jail, and so on, decreases spread of infectious disease, hepatitis C, HIV, decreases crime, and increases program retention in substance abuse program. The data is wonderful. Now, 
it's gone off the rails a little bit. I don't want to get into that. I could spend two, three hours talking about all of the issues on methadone, and I don't want to go into the specifics of the pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and so forth. But in general, these are the issues with methadone. I'm going to add one more issues. Uh, you know, addicts are a smart group of people. In the 70s and the 80s, they also figured out, uh, and I'm going to give you some little uh, sort of pearls associated with methadone that I find uh, uh, something to think about. In the 70s and 80s, addicts really figured out that, you know what, if I take a Valium, a benzodiazepine with my methadone dose, shoot, the high is even better than doing heroin. So they would go in the morning, get their methadone dose, and add 5, 10, 15, 20 milligrams of Valium with it. And uh, this is how they were getting intoxicated. Uh, more recently, in the early 2000s, as the structure of these clinics changed, and these are private clinics under federal regulation. So consider me as a private owner, you're always looking at the bottom line. I think the services declined and the dosing changed a little bit. What was happening in the early 2000s when the black tar heroin started to come up from Mexico, uh, it was a really, really strange phenomena. Uh, they really turned selling heroin, black tar heroin, uh, into a conveyor belt kind of uh, algorithm with a workflow. These guys had this really cheap heroin. They would get in their cars. They'd be hanging out at methadone clinics. And those, some of you might know all this. And guys would go in, get their methadone in the morning. In the afternoon, they'd get their heroin black tar for 20 bucks, 15 bucks, $25. And so it wasn't really adding anything to recovery. It's a heavy drug on the body. I compare it to an old chemotherapy drug. What is methadone? Does it help addiction? Absolutely helps addiction. If given right, and for many people, it has really helped keep them off of using heroin or anything else they're abusing. It has helped them maintain their life. It decreases infectious disease uh, catching it and spreading it. And I think if used the right way, it's a very good drug. I think there's a lot of issues with it that make it a lot more difficult than Suboxone, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, the withdrawal of uh, methadone coming off of it, um, it, it's tough. It's just a regular opiate withdrawal. And it's a little bit weird because since it stores in fat tissues, the initial timeline where we can call the acute withdrawal versus the post-acute withdrawal syndrome is a little bit different and a little bit funky. The data is mixed on this, if we can put scores on it, whether it's worse than heroin or not. Again, it depends on how quickly you come off of it. I will say this about methadone and what I do like about it, even though coming off of it takes quite a, some time, for example, they might start, and again, it depends what state, what program you're in, but if they're cutting your dose by one milligram, two milligrams a day, and you're, let's say, 90 milligrams, and by the way, some people are on 150, 180, 200. If you're doing that that way, here's what I like about methadone, is that it's controlled, and hopefully under a knowledgeable practitioner who manages the withdrawal, slows it down, speeds it up according to your needs. I think the program, some of them are too highly regulated. Uh, if you have marijuana in your system, if you have benzos in your system, you could potentially get kicked out. Uh, and I don't think that's a good, what I call harm reduction approach. Let's move to Suboxone. Uh, and so that is what methadone is. Uh, I, it does help addiction and the data is clear. It comes with some issues. It's a heavy drug. You can overdose on it. Mixing it with other drugs is not a good thing. And it really has an impact on your body. I wanna add one last thing. There's a lot of myths on there out there about methadone, uh, rotting your teeth, getting in your bones, all this kind of stuff. Uh, for the most part, those are all myths. There's no truth to that. You have to understand all of the other what's called comorbidities that a uh, substance abuse patient client has that really affects their body habitus and the secondary medical issues that they may have. Now we can move on to Suboxone. I won't get too much into what Suboxone is. There's other videos I have here that talk about it, but Suboxone was discovered in the 60s, maybe even 63, 67. And unlike methadone, which is a synthetic opiate 
agonist, that means it goes on the receptor and turns it on, suboxone, or rather buprenorphine, which is the general name, and that's the same as suboxone except for one little difference. Uh, that is also a synthetic opiate, but instead of being an agonist, it's something that you can call it an agonist antagonist or a partial agonist. In short, it partly turns on that receptor. And it's also very long acting. This fact that it partly turns on that what's called mu receptor amongst the other receptors lends some very interesting and unique properties to this medication. Number one, since it's long acting, it's wonderful for maintenance medication. Again, remember the issue with something like heroin is your need to constantly dose and your escalating dose and needing more to get high, do euphoria or deal with the pain. Well, Suboxone, just like methadone, is very positive in that you know it's supposed to last about 24 hours. Not as long as methadone, but it lasts quite a bit. Uh, number two, since it's not a full agonist, unlike all of the other drugs, heroin, oxy, fentanyl, and methadone, this is a partial agonist. This is really a key here because what Suboxone does, although it does treat pain, because it hits all of those re uh, receptors, and it's much stronger than morphine, uh, uh, 10 to 100 times, it does not really create that euphoria. Now, somebody might come and say, oh, that's not true. I got, yeah, you got high when you took maybe Suboxone the first time. Every once in a while, someone has a different reaction to it. But for the most part, if you gave me Suboxone and you gave me eight milligrams, sure, I'm gonna get kind of a euphoria from it. But after one or two or three days, that euphoria wears off. But for the user, they probably won't get a euphoria from it. So in general, so, well, actually much more than general. For the most part, there's no euphoria associated with it. And that's because of the property that's an agonist antagonist, partly hits the receptor. Number two, you do not need an escalating dose, okay? Uh, unlike heroin and sometimes methadone, but not really. But all of those other things, heroin, opium, oxys, fentanyl, you continuously need escalating doses to get the same effect, whether it's euphoria or pain. Number three, very powerful pain medication. But there's something, a couple of other things that make it really easy. Uh, like I said, it was discovered in the 60s. There was multiple trials and, and follow throughs with one or two researchers that did most of the studies. But the first time we got some really good data on this uh, medication was in the late 90s when France started to use it as uh, maintenance medication or medication assisted treatment. And then in 2001, the United States brought it as the same medication. And we have just loads of data on this stuff. You don't have to go to a clinic every morning to get this medication. Uh, your dose does not escalate. It has a ceiling effect, again, because of this partial agonist antagonist property that it, I described. So if I continue to take methadone or heroin in escalating doses, I can overdose. And the one area of the brain that kills me is the respiratory depression. Suboxone, it's very difficult to overdose because after a certain thing, and if I showed you the graph, you could see it, after a certain amount, it has a ceiling effect and all of my receptors are theoretically full. So essentially, this medication also takes care of your cravings and withdrawal, doesn't have the euphoria, you don't have to go to a clinic every day, it's much easier to titrate the dose in a shorter period of time versus methadone. And uh, this is fantastic because and one of the things is because it doesn't go and sort of sit there in your fat molecules in your adipose tissue. These are all very, very, very good advantages that make a medication that's being used easy or not easy or whether someone wants to take it or not take it. I'm going to say this, and I get a lot of comments on YouTube on Suboxone, where, uh, and the data shows uh, Suboxone is actually easier to get off of than methadone. This is where I'm going to get a lot of criticism for, and every once in a while you see people talking about this. 
uh, uh, Suboxone's a nightmare. Suboxone is harder to get off than anything. I'm trading one addiction for another. And I think this is a good place to really respond to this, uh, these sorts of comments and these sorts of thoughts. You are not trading one addiction for another when you're talking about going from, let's say, heroin to Suboxone. I've talked about this before in different places, but the idea is and nothing short of ludicrous. The term addiction, the concepts, the, co co uh, the conceptual construct of addiction is this. Let's say we're talking about a pill or heroin. It's a substance that I constantly need to escalate my dose of use and I will do it. The effect uh, can be very harmful to my body. I utilize all of my social, psychological, emotional machinery and resources to gaining that substance as my dose needage escalates. That's addiction. Suboxone doesn't have any of those properties, all right? And so I do not uh, uh, end up on the street, homeless, overdosed, and losing everything on top of the fact that I have secondary diseases, mainly infectious diseases, including HIV, hepatitis C, soft tissue infections, endocarditis, pulmonary edema, overdose, no jail, no absolutely seeking 24 hours a day, seven days a week to seek that substance. That's addiction. And going from that to something like Suboxone, if Suboxone is addiction, then so is insulin. And so is my heart medication. And so is my diabetes medication. So that's one of the things I want to bring up. The second issue, since we're talking about methadone, is when people talk about uh, what a nightmare it is to get off of Suboxone. And you never hear that about methadone, which I really find very, very, very interesting. And this sort of tells me that it's a cultural perspective fed by whatever discussion and discourse is going out there uh, in uh, sort of the cultural landscape and YouTube and social media. And th this is really important. Most of the time that I read people having trouble with Suboxone, they forget to tell me when they're trying to get off of this medication. They also forget to tell me how old they are, what other substance abuse issues they had, how long were they on it, what dose were they on, how quickly did they try to come off, were they under medical supervision, and there's one other fact that's okay to, to say. We don't have any scientific validated data to tell me when it's time to get you off of Suboxone. That's why I, I personally follow my co patients very closely and advise them even before they get started that, you know what? I don't know where you're gonna end up uh, in the long run. I know your deuce, uh, use isn't gonna get more. I know that this is gonna allow you to get on with your life. I know that you shouldn't worry about it right now. For the last seven years, you've been trying to kick heroin and you've basically sat there in your whole life like groundhogs day and nothing's moving forward. Don't worry about Suboxone, but I can't tell you when to get you off. And there's a small percentage of people that may, be, uh, needed, that, that may need to be on it for life. And that's okay. In comparison of Suboxone to methadone, and here's the little uh, dirty truth that no one really talks about. I've never heard this discussion, and this is the most interesting thing to me in all of this, is this. Although I advocate medication and assisted treatment and maintenance medication, which includes Suboxone and Methadone, I'm going to say this, and this may be controversy, uh, and, uh, and I don't know why everyone is not talking about it. I feel that 90% of the people on methadone uh, that are getting on methadone right now, and uh, maybe 70% of the people that are on methadone, and again, these are educated guest numbers, can really get be put on Suboxone and do much better in the long run and have more quality of life with this medication. Because I'd look at it this way. Let me give you an analogy. Old chemotherapy drug, with a lot of side effects that's really heavy on your body, but it'll probably save your life, but you could lose an arm or something, versus the new chemotherapy drug for the same cancer, and it's much cleaner, much easier, and let's say you can take it at home in a pill. 
And some of those people, a small percentage, the new drug fails them and they need to go to the old drug. That's how I perceive Suboxone versus Methadone. Why is nobody talking about it? It hasn't been brought to the forefront of discussion and the machinery and infrastructure for a multi-billion dollar industry of methadone is there. This is not to say there's not a multi-billion dollar industry for Suboxone, but you know, one doesn't want to threaten the other and some of, the, uh, some of us are involved in both. Uh, but you know, you can't really take down an infrastructure. That is my personal clinical educated thought on that issue. I hope you enjoyed the uh, video. If you want to know more about this topic, please press the video above to my left and please go ahead and subscribe to our channel if you want to more, know more context about this and ring the bell.